welcome everyone. We're back with Life in the Peloton. I'm three quarters of the way through this Vuelta España and I've been lucky enough to sit down with my teammate Hugh Carfey. I want to welcome Lionel Burney back to the podcast as well. G'day mate, how are you doing there? I'm good, thanks, Mitch, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this one. Just before we hear your conversation with you, Mitch, just paint the scene for us. What? Uh, where were you chatting? Um, what's the hotel been like today? We were chatting in my hotel room where I am recording this right now. Um, beautiful little hotel here. We're over in Galicia now and getting ready for the stages over here. We've got the time trial tomorrow. It was actually quite a wet morning this morning, so we all jumped on the trainers and did our little blowout session on the rest day but actually it fined up in the afternoon and I went across the other side of the hotel and got my massage over there and it was this beautiful big glass window in my massage therapist's room and we looked out over the coast the rolling waves crashing against the shores and we watched the big tankers go past and one of the best massage views I've had and um, my masseur John said how much would you be paying for this normally? And I couldn't put a figure on it, but it, would, it felt like I was in a luxurious hotel away on a summer retreat getting a massage, let alone I was brought back to reality when I came back to my room and opened up the page for the, the week coming ahead. So um, that was what happened today. I'm in a happy mood. I've got a time trial tomorrow, but then I've got, I break it down to four hard stages and then the time to roll into Madrid after that. Before we get into it, I just have to make a special mention of the way Hugh is riding here. He's really stepped up and he's really opened up. And when I spoke to him last week on Talking Luft over at Life in the Peloton's feed, it was great. It gave me this idea, oh, I'm really going to get him for the big podcast over at the cycling podcast. So I slipped it in there. I didn't tell him. I let him hear it on the podcast. And then he came to me in the bus and said, am I doing the podcast next week as well? I said, you sure are, mate. So he stepped it up. He won the Angrelu stage. I said, well done, mate. That's great work. Now we can got something to talk about on the podcast. So without further ado, sit back and listen to this one. We've got a lot of questions coming in. I want to say thanks to everyone who sent all their questions in. Obviously, we couldn't get through them. It's the most questions we've ever got for a pod. So that was amazing. And all the congratulations to Hugh too. So they were, they were fantastic. So guys, enjoy this one. Welcome to the podcast, Hugh Carthy. You're back again in another week. So I, I cheekily got you last week on Talking Luft. Yeah. Then presented the idea to the whole audience that you were coming back the next week. I didn't Without tell you. Without telling me. Exactly. Yeah, you put the cheeky bastard card on me, but I'll <laughs> forgive you. But I knew potentially something might good might, something good might happen in the next week. I was unaware that you would be at the top of Angrelu first which was yesterday. So I'm bloody happy to have you back on the pod, mate. Thank you for coming back. My pleasure. That's Hugh Carthy. For anyone who didn't hear the Talking Luft, go back and have a listen to that. That's over on my um, feed, Life in the Peloton. Before we get started, well, actually, as we're getting started, I've got to go straight to it. We're less than 24 hours from the stage win. And I know a lot of people are wanting wanting to hear about it. Let's just go straight to that. Let's just go straight to Angrelu. The Queen Sage, wow, equal Queen Sage in this race. Saturday and Sunday were very hard days, but Angrelu is the mountain in Spain. We were discussing this before the race. What are the five hardest mountains in the world? And Angrelu, we think, is on the podium, if not atop of that podium. Run me through what you think, what you thought about coming into this stage when we're sitting in the bus yesterday, sort of bantering away about the stage. Your feelings, because I, if, even from speaking to you from that last podcast, we indicated a few little things, talking to me on the mountain, little things you've said along the way, your legs are being good in this race. So you run me through coming into yesterday's stage, how are you feeling? Yeah, again, another day where you wake up and you jump out of bed and you just feel right, you know, you some days when you're not going well, you don't sleep well, or you, you get up and your back's hurting, or you just things just go wrong you know you just you're pouring your milk on your cereal and you overflow the bowl you're not concentrating but the past couple of weeks everything's just gone nicely you know everything just felt right on and off the bike I've been getting up in the morning full of energy and you just know you I, I like for me a lot of riders don't like walking upstairs and I agree with that you don't walk upstairs but for me I like to walk down the stairs 
you can feel your legs, you know, especially on your, your quads and your, your thighs. You feel your legs. If, you, if you've had a hard day or your body's not quite 100%, it, it, it's, it's really, really painful. But the past couple of weeks, I've been, I've been trotting down the stairs to breakfast or trotting down after the stage. And I've been hearing other people wincing, oh, legs are tired. And I've been just sort of floating Harry Potter style down the down the stairs on my broomstick um, without sounding <laughs> arrogant. But yeah, I just think, yeah, you know, I, I knew, I've known the whole race that my legs have been good. I've been recovering well, sleeping well, eating well. Um, the atmosphere in the team's been good, which is, gives you an extra gear. So yeah, everything's been spawned for me so far. Yeah, and that's that's the sort of feeling you want coming into such a stage yesterday. You know, with two cat threes, two cat twos, and then the Angleroo. How do you how do you pronounce it? Angleroo. Angleroo, sorry, not kangaroo as I like to call it. Ang- Angleroo, whatever you. <laughs> Ang- Angleroo. The Angleroo. So to not feel that fear of it, not fearing a mountain, I think that'd be a an amazing feeling coming to this and just be like, all right, I'm just going to give it what I've got because I'm not scared of it. And is that the feeling you had coming to that hill yesterday? Yeah, but the, the day, stay, stage 11, I was a little bit apprehensive despite what I just said a minute ago about feeling great. I was a little bit apprehensive. I, I felt good, but that was like, that was sort of a killer stage. You know what I mean? It could, it, you can, you can, I've been in days like before we start off well and then uh, a team like Movistar or Ineos put a, put a hard rhythm on a climb and next thing you're uncomfortable and your head goes and you think oh well it's over so I was a little bit nervous going to that stage I felt good at the start and I rode well through and I felt great at the end and I lost a few seconds at the finish I had a few messages a couple of messages from people at home saying saying exactly what I was thinking when I crossed the line and I, I knew there was a gap and I thought oh bloody hell I've lost a few seconds but I felt great it was just a it, it was a headwind climb it was a negative sort of climb negative sort of race no one really wanted to show the cards and I think maybe people on TV saw it and thought oh he's lost a few seconds he's not, he's not so great but I knew and the people my family and a few friends that I train with at home and they know me in, in, inside out they knew exactly the scenario they, mm. were, they said ah, we saw you were great we saw you were floating up mm. that climb you could see it in your face you could see it in your legs you were fresh you're going to be great tomorrow. And I knew it myself. I said, to, uh, I said, so I don't read too much into that result. Mm. It, well, it's easy to sit here now and say it on, 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 the, on the podcast, but I, I don't think I expected to win. I never expect to win. No, no rider is arrogant enough to expect to win. But I was apprehensive going into stage 11, but I was confident that I was good in stage 12, barring mm. any, any bad luck or bad fortune, whatever. I knew I'd be there at the end. Mm. Winning, I don't know, is winning your local crit in your hometown is difficult you know what I mean yeah, yeah. to win any race is difficult local or on the world stage but if I'd been in the top five yesterday maintain my fourth on GC put time to some people behind maybe gain time moved up a spot I'd have been I'd have been thrilled with that but to win yeah it was uh, it's hard to describe I mean people think I'm a man of few words you know they see my interviews I don't give much away and think oh he's a he's a He's real, a little, uh, I don't know what the word is, sort of... Shy. Shy, he doesn't get involved. But with my teammates, no, I'm, I'm pretty hard to it's shut qu- up. Yeah, it's quite the opposite, I'm I can quite, tell you. It's hard to shut me up once I get going. <laughs> but yesterday, the finish, I was, I was, and I'm sort of diverting from the question, but sort of rambling now, but I was... Lost for words. Lost for words. Yeah. I, I, it happened last year in, when I won into the Swiss. It's a strange feeling, you you when you a year like this not not any year but especially this year where you go through so much uncertainty and cycling as a as a career it's, an, it's mm. not like football where you're 20 and you get a seven year contract with Man United or Man City and you, you're earning 100 grand a week and you think 100 grand a week for a year save up and then I'm set for life mm. you know what I mean in our job you, you can earn good money and you can have a nice career but it's not it's not the same league as other sports you you always got that kind of fear of the future in your mind you yeah. think you think what am i going to do if i don't get a next contract i want to do and the i've said it before and it's quite it's quite a common answer quite a quite a common feeling you just feel relieved when you win mm. you feel relief for me my family the team you think i've given the team like the i think every team at the moment is looking for looking for a way forward through this through the crisis that we're in um, some teams more than others but our team needs every every victory counts at this point it's it's not like we're hanging on by any means but the you think well, I really hope I've my victory has played a part in the future of the team 
and other people, the people like yourself who, you're not a team leader, you're the guy that has to put me in the right position before I climb or drag me across in a crosswind or drag me across a gap or make a gap. The victories are for you as well. These, mm. these victories keep you in a job, you know what I mean? They, they, they keep the, the guys that you don't see winning. It's relief for everyone, I think. You know what I mean? It's I think, yeah, I think you put a few points there, really good points is that there comes a time in your career that you've got to capitalize on everything you've built up. Mm-hmm. And I feel like over your career, you've been building, you've been building, and last year in Swiss and even some other results before then, it times to capitalize on it. And sometimes you see these riders who get to that point, they don't quite capitalize on that form and they just don't get those victories. And they sort of fade away and they never really get that contract or that accolations I think they deserve. An amazing thing with you is that it's it's happening and you're realizing it in the moment. You're like, I've got to make most of these chances. And then on the other side of that, I think this is great too, is that people really, it's the victory is not just for you. No. And it's about a lot of people into the support. It's not just me. It's not just the family. It's everyone around it. It's the team. It's everyone. And so you feel that. You feel that in the success too, I can imagine. Yep. I want to cut straight now to 2K to go. Yep. Because as anyone... Well, not everyone might know this, but the climb is 12K. We come directly off a of Cat 1, 5K Cat 1, straight into the bottom of the Angrelu. And then it's pretty... Tame. Tame at the start. When I say tame, it's about 8%, between 8 and... T- that would normally be cut one gradient. Yeah, but it feels okay because you, and then you get this one k little respite flat. It was beautiful. Yep. And then at about six and a half k to go, it kicks. Yep. And it really does kick straight away, but it doesn't kick yet. It sort of just thins everything out. Run me through the first part when it kicks at six k to go, but then especially tell me about this the hell kilometer at two k to go. Um. Yeah, so 6k to go, that's where the sort of the real climb starts. And for me, I, I can relax then. For me, the bits the bits that I don't like in the stage are you know, the downhills and you think, oh, things can happen here or the, the flat bits, the possible split or whatever. So when I arrive at any climb, the final climb, mountain top finish, I hold the doubt and fear, whatever, bang, out. You throw it out and all you have to do is just use your legs mm-hmm. and not panic and stuff that's that so when I got to the climb first and foremost that was sort of for me job done I was like I'm here this is going to be great my legs are good nothing can go wrong in, in a way so we get to 6k to go I think right this is it now nothing technically can go wrong no, it's just, I think it's, yeah, it's just down to physical now yeah it's yeah, just yeah. physical yeah. I mean you got bad luck obviously yeah. but that's bad luck um, so then when I get to 6k to go the climb really starts and I thought well we've got the we've got the low gears on the bikes so uh, I'm going to be fine what were you feeling at that moment? Were you comfortable? I was Pretty- feeling good. The, the group was small by then, maybe 15 riders. I don't know, 15 or so riders. I still had Mike Woods with me, which is, even though you sat behind me, I think having someone sat behind you in pink, as a teammate, whatever colour, pink, in our case, it's like having someone's hand on your back. Mm. So you have like a bodyguard. They can, if someone wants to try and get on your wheel to try and come past you, they can sort of... It's a bit safe. Yeah, not, you not feel safe. Yeah. On. yeah, you feel safe. You feel secure. So it's another weight off your mind. You all you have to still you, you just focus on your legs. Again, uh, we get closer up the climb. Then I start seeing people throwing out bottles. It was quite a warm day yesterday for mm. the first of November in the north of Spain, and I still had a little bit left in my bottle. So I thought oh. I used that in thought in my head. I thought oh, I've got an advantage here. I'm kind of tiny bit of extra weight, but six k, five k. And these gradients, that's still half an hour of climbing, half yeah, an hour of climbing. I would think so. That's a long time without a drink in my eyes. So I thought, well, I'm gaining an advantage here with this. Mm. And if, they, if they're throwing them out with such a long way to go, then maybe they're desperate for that extra little advantage. So mm. I carried on. Uh, Psychological games coming in. I like it. Yeah. So we get to 5K to go, and I'd save one last gel for 5K to go. I didn't really need it, but I had it, and I thought, I'll take it. 5K to go, I'll take it. 5K to go, took the gel. I responsibly dispose of the wrapper. Uh, and again, we carry on. And then in, uh, 4K to go, I can't really remember what was happening. It was just it was just Lotto Jumbo or Jumbo Visma. They were riding their tempo. They had two guys left with Roglic. Carapaz was on his own. Uh, Enrique Mas was on his own by this point. Dan Martin on his own. And I still had Woodsy behind. So, Were you comfortable at this pace or was it starting to hurt now? No, it wasn't hurting. It really wasn't hurting. I think it would have been I think it was hurting but I was so focused 
and feeling so good that it wasn't yeah you weren't like oh, I don't know if I can hang on one more no, K you I were wasn't just like, like that. I, okay, I, I knew I point. knew that if they carried on like that I'd have made it to the top easy yeah or easy no but comfortably yeah, yeah. within my limit um, so I wasn't I was never panicking then I think 3k to go Enrique Mass went when you say when you say go you never really attack on a clown like that you just lifted his own pace and got a gap so I thought okay I'm feeling good I'm going to lift my pace and, and just up my pace ever so slightly not try and reel him in and get in his wheel just just hold the pace slightly higher see what happens behind and then at that point because sorry to interrupt I don't know if you're thinking this, but to a degree, there's no real advantage about sitting in someone else's wheel at that point. Absolutely, at not. those gradients. The only thing is, you 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 have like a carrot in front of you, and yeah. you you stick with someone, you can hold their rhythm. That's the only thing. But aerodynamically, um, yeah, there's no real advantage. Um, so Enrique Mass went. I, I followed him. I raised my tempo, and at that point, normally Roglic and Carapaz are pretty quick to react to things, and they didn't react at that point. So I thought. Mm. Mm. this is maybe something so then I thought okay well I'm not going to try and get Enrique Mass back because I think he's quite a passionate rider he does something he, does, he races in a way sometimes where he can be quite courageous and then then he blows mm. I've done it before I did it on stage 7 or 8 mm. in La Grande or that area were uh, you thinking this at the time or is this in hindsight now no this is the time I was thinking okay just hold my rhythm I remember what Juanma said in the morning the director said in the morning Don't, nobody attacks on that climb you can't attack you just got to ride your own pace mm. if you've got gas extra gas lift your rhythm don't attack just don't go into the red because you never recover so I had that in the back of my mind so I thought okay don't try and chase him back normally on a flatter climb an easier climb you make an extra effort to get into someone's wheel to use their slipstream. But in mm. this case, I was thinking, no, don't make that extra effort to mm. get to him. Just stay here, trust that he's going to blow or whatever, he's going to he's going to come back or the others. But at that point, the others the others behind Roglic and Carapaz, Dan Martin, and I think Vlasov was there from Astana. They came back to us and then Carapaz went. And maybe Enrique Mass went again, I can't remember. Then it was just the three of us at that point. We got Roglic, Dan Martin, then I thought, okay, those guys have got punch. If they if they could have followed, they would have followed. Mm. At that point, I thought, okay, and I was feeling good. And then, we're having, this is like two k to go, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, more or less two k to go. And at this point, we're going slowly, slowly, and then we're sort of riding three abreast, almost across the road. And I thought, well, it's not far now. It's about three minutes until my finish line, the top. When you yeah. get to the KOM line, it's downhill all the way. If I get there with a few seconds, five. T- oh, a small gap, that gap will be... Open up. It'll be like an accordion. It'll open right up when you start going at 30, 40 k an hour in the flat section. And I was feeling comfortable. I thought, okay, I've got to go. So I went. <laughs> and I went. I look, uh, I look around on one of the, the hairpins. I had a nice little gap. And I thought, well, at least we're doing 10 k an hour. I thought, a nice little gap at 10 k an hour is a big gap. Yeah, If you're is. doing 25 k an hour on a normal 6 7% climb, that'll be 50, 60, 70 meters. So I thought, this is it. I'm gonna. Uh, all I have to do is get to the top, and then I put it in the big chain ring. It flattened out slightly. What did it, it went down to like 14 percent? Did it? I love it. Like, I think it was 10 percent. <laughs> so I put it in the big chain ring and really gave it some on that. The fl- the faster section, trying to uh, trying to open. Then I, I come round the corner again. I think, oh shit! And you can see the road kicking up again to 20 percent. Like, oh. So I had to go down to the small dog again. Spin up the last bit. Just really. Oh, it must have looked terrible on TV, but I was I was giving it. I was suffer. I was suffering then. I was. I thought this is sort of do or die. You gotta. This. This is it now. This is it. You've. You made your decision to go. Do it. You've got to. You've either got to do it now, or it's never going to happen. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I think when I went, if they could have followed me, they would. So I was in the back of my mind thinking they're going to have to make some effort to bring this gap back. Then I passed the KOM point. Uh, I didn't. I still look behind. Juanma was. Telling me in the radio I had a good gap, 20 seconds, something to Carapaz and Enrique Mass. Then I got to about 500 metres to go and, and I could not, yeah, I looked I look round because the road was kind of exposed behind so you could mm. see and they weren't even in sight. So I thought, oh, there's just no way. There's no way. Me. They were they were 400 or 500 metres behind me at that point, maybe a little bit less, but they were, I still couldn't see them. So they were, they were, they were along, like I said, in the accordion effect on that climb. It looked like they were, they could have touched me physically, but. <laughs> on the steep bit but when you go on to the flat bit the the gap was the gap was huge so then that was it I just 
I still carried on going, but I just enjoyed it the last 500 metres. I, I caught my breath, got goosebumps, and uh, yeah, just just enjoyed it. Yeah. Got the arms up and, and uh, enjoyed it. Mate, that's that's brilliant. That's I had to go back and watch it last night on the bus. I heard the whole thing in the radio as I was 6, 7K down the road, but it's amazing to feel, to see that, just to hear the emotion behind it. It was... Uh, it was a great day, mate. It was it was a fantastic day. What I want to do is I want to go back a little notch now. And in case anyone doesn't know a little bit about you, I just want to talk quickly about where you've come from. Mm-hmm. You're from Preston in Lancashire. Yep. You started off there. You ended up riding on Rafa Condor, Rafa JLT, Rafa Condor JLT, yeah. Rafa Condor JLT. Then you went across to Spain and rode for Cajaral. After Cajaral, you came on to Cannondale, which is now EF. Yep. I've got some questions that have been sent in, um, yep. which are a few questions about this period because I did want you to talk a little bit about this period about coming through. But I thought, why not now go into some Q and A? And we can talk about some of these questions as well. Let's go. So Anton and Aham- Ahmed, they sent in a question in saying, what was it like learning the ropes at Kaharal? Is it quite different from the usual path? I don't know. It's the, path, it's the only path I took, so I don't know what the other path is. But for me, it was a, it was a baptism of fire. It wasn't easy at first, uh, integrating, learning the language. But after a couple of months, it was, it was great. The team accepted me, everyone... Everyone saw that I had ability and uh, they saw that I'd made a, the effort that I made to learn the language and integrate the, everyone appreciated that. Mm. And yeah, it was a really great two years. It was, I would not change that part of my career for the world. I honestly wouldn't. I have a second question on that. And this is something that I think is a, a great part about not starting in a normal, let's say Australian AI, Australian Institute of Sport or the British Academy, mm-hmm. is that you get more worldly. And now when you're on the Peloton, you've got your own mates, Spanish mates. You've got yeah. a connection with Movistar. You've got a connection with the Cajaral guys, whoever it is. You've been on team with some of these guys. You've trained with guys living in Pamplona. Mm-hmm. Plus, you've got all your old mates from, from the UK. Do you see that as a big advantage now being a pro and whether they're mates or whether they're not mates, you can communicate with a lot more guys. You have a lot more respect in the Peloton because you've come through a different way. Yeah, I think the language is the biggest thing. It's, I think in... I think less so now because ninety percent of the peloton, say ninety percent of the peloton, speak English. But I think being able to speak in a speak a language is a it, it is a tool to trade. You know, it's a, if you're on a breakaway with someone and you want to have a sneaky, quiet word with another guy, form a little bond and attack together or something. You can do it without everyone knowing. Or mm. I think it's just good to know different people, know the few directors that speak Spanish or things or whatever. If you speak Italian, the same thing. You can you can speak with Italian directors or Italian riders and stuff, and it can definitely it can definitely help you in the races. It's uh, it's not just about being friends or mm. having people to talk to. It's it definitely can be a tool a tool of the trade to use and use to to good effect. But yeah, it's nice, especially now. Even before I came to this came to this race a few weeks ago at home, I said, oh yeah, it'd be nice to go to the Welter. It's where my the Welters, well, the Spain Spain's where my career really really started. I don't, I don't say I've got a lot of fans in Spain, but there are a lot of people that, mm. especially in the north of Spain, that's a second look, home. Yeah, they they look out for me and they uh, they support me for a long time. So it, it's sort of it's not. I, I love it. even in the hotels. You can see when I get excited being in the Spanish hotels. Even it's just ordering the coffees and the the treatment we get and stuff. And it's nice just to be able to. I, I love it. I love being back in Spain. I love being you know speaking with the staff and the mm. hotels and the fans and stuff I think that, yeah the Spanish Spanish fans and things it's the real more so than in the country they're more connoisseurs you know what I mean the, mm. the connoisseurs of cycling you know they don't just follow the Spanish riders in in, in France a lot of the time they, they just follow the French riders in Italy they just follow the Italian riders but uh, in Spain the, they follow everyone they don't mm. care if you're Australian British Canadian Spanish Italian or Japanese South African, they don't care. The, the they support. They support. Mm. If you, if you're a bike racer, you got a number on your back. They'll support you and they'll know you. There's a lot of times you're you're out the arse of the race in the Gruppetto and 
Do you know a lot of times you're out the ass in the back. I've, I, we've had this argument before. I've done my I've done my time in the group over the years. Okay. Don't don't think for one minute I've been in the front group on grand tours. I've I've suffered through a few grand tours in my time. But yeah, you're out the arse there, and not not my name, but you hear like random guys that you wouldn't even expect, and the fans the fans are shouting them, giving them a little push, pat on the back, mm. uh, giving them a can of coke or something, shouting the name. I, I I honestly believe that the Spanish fans are up there. They've the cycling fans are the, the best the best there are, mm. they really are the best there are. There's another point where they, I don't want to bring Corona into it. I really don't. But a part of me would have felt terrible this year if the Vuelta hadn't happened. Because in my in my eyes, out of all the Grand Tours for the fans, I feel like the Spanish fans deserve the Vuelta more than mm. any other country. I mean, the Tour. I mean, cycling without the Tour, it wouldn't it wouldn't be half of half as big as it is. And the Giro, the same story. But even though the Vuelta is probably the, the smallest of the three Grand Tours, to, if we're being honest, o- yeah. honest and factual, it's probably the smallest of the Grand three Grand Tours. But it would have felt the, I'd be the most disappointed if the Vuelta hadn't have come off mm. because I think the fans in Spain really 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 appreciate even the ones don't really follow cycling the uh yeah it would have been it would have been a shame so i'm i'm happy we're here with the second rest day so far so good touch wood look what we've got we've got a again like in the giro and the tour we've got coming into a tt with the race tight as a screw screw <laughs> Uh, one question here a few people ask which part of the mountain hurt the most yesterday yeah um, I think the beginning the beginning sometimes hurts the most because you you come, you come off a descent of the you come oh, off yeah. a descent straight into the climb your legs are a bit you, your legs kind of turn to stone a little bit on on the descent and you got to sort of find your find your legs again but once you find your legs and you, you come back you, it's, it's okay then Steve was asking was it always planned the final attack on Angrelo um, if I had the good legs and I was in the right position, um, yeah, that was planned. We knew that with around a K to go, it got easier. It well, it, it was downhill all the way. Whoever got to the top first won. Mm-hmm. The K one point. Whoever got to the K one point first would probably win, unless it was a group, like a, a small group. Unless but someone was in your wheel. If you were yeah. solo at that K one point, you were going to win the stage. Even with five second gap, you were going to win the stage. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, there, was, there was factors that depended on me attacking at that point if I hadn't been great and I hadn't had the legs I probably wouldn't have been able to attack mm. or be able to make launch my final move but um, the legs were there the group was reduced enough there were people hanging on so I thought yeah this is going going. this is dream scenario this is we talk a lot about the dream scenarios and the boss okay well we're going to attack here we're going to do this we do that and being honest, it, it rarely works out like that. It's mm. not a, it's not, it's not a PlayStation game. Um, but yesterday it was, it couldn't have worked out any better. The the group was right. I was feeling great. The moment was there, and it all worked out sweetly. Perfect. What was your gearing on twi- uh, stage twelve? The gearing ratio. This is from Night Rule Air. So um, we had. On the front chain rings, we had a 34 small chain ring and a 53 big chain ring. I thought you had a 52. No, 53. It's quite a rare. It's quite a rare combination. FSA have made us some special 53 chain rings, but for the small 110 size spider. Mm. Normally, with 110, I think you only go up to 52. Normally, I think. That's what I thought. If you were going to buy them, but I think we have some special 53 ones made. And then behind, I had an 11 32. Cassette. Mm. So my lowest gear was 34 at the front, 32 at the back. The biggest gear, 5311, the standard. Did you use that? I did use it. Yeah. I, was, I did use it a lot. And there were times where I was using it and I was still grinding. Yeah. If you want to know how hard Steep the it is. is. And that was it. I don't know how many watts, but six six watts per kilo, six and a half watts per kilo on some of those really steep ramps where you just had to go full gas. And you're still, and you're grinding. still grinding in yeah. 34, 32. This is from Liam. Are there any climbs com- that compare to the Angrelu? Motorolo, which is harder? Angrelu is harder, harder. Motorolo is constant. It's uh, it's hard, but it's not. It's not even. It's not as steep. The Motorolo road surface isn't great, but I don't know. I, I the, when I did the Motorolo last year, the legs my legs were great, so you, the climb doesn't feel. Well, know. we don't have the same gearing on it, do? You? Last year, I think we had 34, 34 oh. at the front. 32. 30 at the back. Oh, 30. 
What's the hardest climb then? The hardest climb? I don't know. The hardest climb is always the one where you're getting spat on. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, I said Zonkaland. Zonkaland's hard because that was a really steep climb. But I think the Angleroo's harder. It's different circumstances with different years. And mm. I'm better now. I'm older, better. I'm going to have to say, I don't know. I did the Motorola on a similar day to yesterday with great legs. And I'd say that the, Zonk- uh, the Angleroo is harder than the Motorola. But I guess the thing is the Motorola, it's always going over it and onto something else. Yeah, the Motorola, you, I've done it think, twice now and I, every time it's always been either midway through a stage or at the end of a stage, but you've descended off it. Mm. And in some ways the descent can be harder than the, the climb itself. The descent off the Motorola is a, it's a real horror show of a descent. Mm. It's, it's steep, it's twisty. bad road, it's yeah. twisty, bit bad, uh, slippy roads. So, yeah. What's going through your head? This is from JJ. What's going through your head? Is it in J- I the don't mechanic, know if JJ? it's JJ the mechanic. It could be Let's JJ. Let's presume it is JJ the mechanic. Yeah. What's going through your head when the bike breaks down? Are you thinking... No, that's not the question. <laughs> <laughs> What's going through your head on a gnarly mountain stage with GC or a stage considerations at play? Are you primarily in the present and focus on what's going on around you? and team tactics or do you slash can you take your mind elsewhere no you always stay in the game you mm. stay you stick to the plan until you get to a point where you know you, when you're a professional and you've got the direct nowadays with the director and the earpiece and the TVs and the cars that sixth sense you have it you have it in the car as well you you, you have to make the decision yourself ultimately you feel the pain you feel the road and the, the way the race is but you know what I mean you, you just know but mm. you've got to stay you've got to stay calm when you're feeling good the worst thing you can do is get carried away you've got to wind it in you know what I mean just think okay we stick to the plan stick to the plan and execute the, when you execute the plan you execute 100% don't execute it early and then the moment you oh, run too you early or have excuses afterwards yeah, yeah. Um, but at the same time I don't know it's a difficult one I think it depends on the stage it really mm. does depend on the stage and it depends on the team you've got with you Mm. If you've got a really strong team of climbers with you, you can I think you can be more daring. But if you if you're sort of on your own, I was with Woods yesterday, and so there's two of us. But and we're both Woods is really going. To be honest, he finished ninth on the stage. That's a mm. ninth on one of the hard the Queen stage. Mm. After he's been working for me for the past few days in the climbs, we were a real strong duo. But you've got to be careful when you're on your own and you've only got one team with you. You've got to be careful because mm. um, if it goes tits up you can uh, yeah you can quickly be on the back foot chasing him with without much uh, without many resources tell me this this is from Matthew how does someone from Preston elevation of 266 meters become the world's best climber well I'm gonna have to correct you Matthew is it Matthew yeah Preston is not 266 meters what is it I think it's it's been like it's around 50 it's below 50 Where's he pulled 266 from? I think from? maybe he's thinking of Preston in some... He's typing Preston into somewhere and... <laughs> or maybe his, maybe his GPS watch has... Uh, he's not calibrated it recently. Regardless, a low place. Is it? Has it got anything to do with living in Andorra now? No, I think I've always been a good climber. And mm. I think, you know what I mean? You are what you are. I'm built for climbing. You look at me, I'm built for climbing. Yeah. It's as simple as that. It doesn't matter whether you're from altitude or from sea level. You, if you're built for climbing, you'll be good at climbing. Look at guessing. Exactly. It's from Holland. Yeah. This is from Samia. What does the recovery period, training period between the Tour de France and the Vuelta look like for Hugh? Any specific training sessions to build back up? Because it was a quite a funny year this year. You yeah. know, it was only, what was it, four weeks between the, the end of the Tour de France and the start of this? Yeah. So it was pretty tight. Yeah. What happened for you in that four weeks? So uh, the day after the Tour de France, I flew to Imola and to the World Championships, which was, it was nice to do, but oh, my head and my legs were ready for it. I had it, I picked up an injury in the tour of my arm. I crashed on my arm and I was pretty downbeat about that, well, about this and that. And I still finished the tour well. I rode well enough for the final week, um, doing what I could for the team. But uh, I was ready for a bit of a break. I was ready just to, I was wanting to get my arm right. At the time when I was told you, you we, we, we might need you to the welter, we're not got many riders left at this point. I was thinking bloody hell, I could just, just want to, I just want to get on the beers. No, you're not even that. Just, just want to get my arm right and just relax a bit. Uh, so I went to Imola. My arm still wasn't right, and 
I remember like half of the week, a few days before the World Championships, I, I tried to open a bottle of water on the on the table. And I'd been telling everyone my arm was getting better and my arm was getting better. And I tried to open it in my left arm and I, and I couldn't open this bottle of water because I couldn't grip tight enough. I remember a couple of people looking at me funny thinking, should you really be here? Yeah. And I was like, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And it was okay. It was my arm, on the bike, my arm was more or less okay at that point. A few days before the World Championships, I, the team's sort of sprung it on me that the the something had happened to one of the riders who was due to do flesh for loan and I needed to fly to Belgium so I was like Bloody hell. if I'd known I was going to have to go to Belgium I wouldn't have done the world champion I'd have gone home for a week of rest and so I was like oh then, then I was tired at the World Championships. I was, I was. Then I went to, I flew to Belgium the night, out, the night of the World Championships. So we arrived late that night in, in wherever it was, in somewhere in Belgium, Genk. Yeah, Genk. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's Genk, right. Yeah, in the Ardennes, uh, or somewhere near there. I arrived there, and I was just, I was just out of it. You know what I mean? I was just, I was just over it. Yeah. The well, it was still. I was thinking, if I'm doing the welter, I don't really want to be. I just want to be at home, just resting. And and I hadn't been at home since before the Dauphiné. Oh my gosh! We've been a week before the Dauphiné. We went to the Dauphiné to sort of quarantine, stay in a safe zone. Post Dauphiné, we went back to Andorra, but we stayed in a hotel. I wasn't allowed to go home. I wasn't allowed to see friends. We stayed in our own <laughs> sort of uh, reclusive bubble. And then we went straight to the tour, to the tour, then to Imola, then to Flesh Alone. So I said, just please, just let me go home for a week. And the team were understanding, but at the same time, I was understanding as well because the the whole the whole calendar at that point was just there was about four different calendars going on, mm. and obviously with riders being injured, sick or whatever, they had to pull riders out of hats. You know what I mean? And just make people do things they didn't necessarily want or need to do. So then, what did you do from there? How long was it from there to the Vuelta? Well, two weeks. There, about two weeks ish. About two two and a half weeks. So anyway, after Belgium, I was I was cooked. I was completely cooked. Uh, I was I couldn't sleep properly. My had ulcers. My I was drawn. I was bag under my eyes. But then I thought, okay, well, then I thought, oh, just this is it. I'll just do the welter and just sack it for the year. So what did you do when you got home? Just rested. Yeah, I rested for a few days. Then I got back on. We got back on my bike and started training. And I felt okay. I thought I actually feel okay here. I had a few nice days rest. I switched off. Uh, had a couple of beers and relaxed a little bit with some friends and. I started to ride my bike and I thought I don't feel half bad here mm. I don't feel terrible anyway I've picked up a lot in the past few days and at that point this was probably 10 days or a week or so before the world so week 10 days before the world and I was I was doing some decent training rides some long train rides and stuff trying to get just keep the keep the form going I was still with an eye to the world and uh, Charlie Wigalius rang me while I was out training and he said oh you we we've we've got we've got sort of the all clear from the team to ride to start the world with seven riders so if if you if you don't want to do it you still you still cooked we know you cooked you don't have to do it but if you do want to do it there's no pressure on you there's a spot there's a spot there if you want to take it you can do but if you don't the team can start with seven riders it's not an issue um you can pull it after 10 days get to the first, get to the second rest day or something and then uh today. Then put them today and and stop yeah. and uh, rest up and focus for next year it's going to be a big year for you next year you just rest up for that um, but at that point I was motivated to race the world tour I felt the past few days my training had been going well and the sensations were good the numbers I was hitting nice numbers in training and I was actually starting to get motivated mm. thinking we'll see what something happens something good I've been in the situation before where you 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 sort of dead man walking and then two weeks later you got the form of your life so I thought I'm just going to have to see how this goes and then the, the days after that I was starting to get more and more and more motivated and uh, here we are here we are nice one mate I like it really good to hear the backstory of that moving on through these quickly on the bus rev up music this is from Lexo and Nicola what are you listening to are you listening to a podcast are you listening to anything what sort of music goes through your head you got a good little music taste yeah a bit of a mixed bag for me I'll, I'll, I'll go with anything but I think we've got it right with the we have our own playlist each rider at the start this is Mitch's idea each rider at the start of the world tour start of the grand tour picks 10 of their favourite songs or 10 crowd pleasers whatever they, they got free free reign pick any song they like 10 songs all goes into a hat on the playlist and then we shuffle the playlist for the next three weeks while we're getting changed or on the journey to the start we stick around and then uh, 
it creates discussion as well because mm. on the first time we hear all the songs, the first the first kind of cycle of the playlist, a lot of, is they got a guess. Oh, who picked this one? Who picked this one? And mm. some guys play like keep it a bit of a guessing game. They don't. They say, oh no, I don't. Then we find out that oh, it was you. Yeah. Know. And some of them are surprising. Some of them. Some of them are quite easy to pick out. But then some some songs you you think oh, I did not expect that from him. <laughs> it is quite good, isn't it? It's a, it's a good little good little sort of an icebreaker is not the not the right expression, but oh, it's nice to learn about your teammates. You like, yeah. I did not see no, that. About you. you forget about the race. You get into, you, mm. get, you can get a bit heated. You're like, oh, who the big this one? What, what were you thinking? What, mm. This is a shocker of a song. What you thought? Oh, wait, I didn't know you like this music. It, mm. it brings you together and and separates you at the same time. Sometimes. <laughs> Uh, next one here. What are you guys drinking during the Walter stage? Uh, what do you drink? Mix, mix, mix. That's scratch mix. Yeah, I have a scratch Morton mix. mix. Yeah, well, we're quite fortunate. We have about fifteen different drinks we can have. Yeah, but the I, we, the Swan years come to us before the race starts, and they make a list and say, okay, so what do you want to start with? Normally during the stage it's less important you know yeah. you, you get what you get you can yeah you can get if you're getting one from the side of the road it's always a mix mm. yeah it's always a, an important bottle to get so it's always a mix but the start some riders pick rego for example likes a one water one mix on his mm. bike at the start i always go for one mix one mix which is standard mix standard carbohydrate drink nothing a carbohydrate with isotonic salts yeah. in it some riders like yourself you say a morton Morton Which is drink. a high carbohydrate drink. Very high carbohydrate drink. Some guys like one of those and one mix or one Morton high carb drink and one water. water. It's your choice. You can choose and this one years will uh, prepare it for you. Gels with caffeine or without? What flavour gel is your favourite? This is um, from Desmo. Gels, okay. Uh, caffeine gels I'm not a big fan of. I don't really I don't really get into those. Uh, I don't know why. They just. I just never have. Um, do you have the Morton gels or the OTE gels? I usually stick with the OTE gels. Uh, the Morton gels are good. I like them, but the flavours of the OTE gels are more... They can just give you a bit more of a... What's your favourite? For me, the apple. Apple flavour. Hmm, nice. Apple flavour or the lemon and lime. But they're all good. And and to be honest, we said this before the other day, when you're in a race, it's in one line, you reach for a gel, you're on a climb, they all taste the same. You don't... Hmm. You don't think, oh, this apple flavored gel's nice when you're doing no. 450 watts hanging on for grim death. You, you know just slam I mean? it down. You don't give it two shits. You think, oh, that that gel's gonna help me out here. <laughs> you don't think that apple apple gel or that black currant gel was great. How do you manage? How do you? How do you? Or how do you manage um, being top five in a grand tour? It's not something you're used to. How have you been managing it so far? It's a first for me, but I think I'm managing it quite well. I think for me, I get. I get better with less pressure, less stress, less pressure. Having a good team around me that's working for me and confident in me brings the best out of me. Some riders crumble under that. They think, oh, I've got the work, I've got the weight of eight riders on my shoulders or seven guys helping me on my shoulders, the staff on my shoulders, the directors on my shoulders. But for me, uh, it gives me an extra push. I think, okay, I've got to perform. You know what I mean? Not in a bad, not in a pressure way, but like, I can't, I can't, not I can't lose, but I can't, nothing can go wrong. Mm. You know what I mean? I've got a team. I don't have to waste any energy on silly things. It's, it's a positive it's, thing. It's a positive yep. thing for me. And I don't think of it as, oh, I've got so much to lose. I think every day that I keep in this position is less weight off my shoulders, you know what I mean? Mm. So like the first day I did well, second day I did well, third day I did well, fourth day, everything. Third, every day I've done well, chipped away at the GC. I got knocked back a couple of places on one stage. I've gained a place yesterday, won the stage. So now after winning the stage, for me, it's it's almost job done yeah it's and not job done. anything it's from here is positive yeah anything if, if it all goes if it all goes pear-shaped on tomorrow or the next days then i've won a stage and i had two weeks in the top five that's fantastic mm. for me and for any any rider that's still fantastic mm. so that attitude i think for me is the best way to get the best out of myself having low stress no no real expectation not saying i'm gonna win that stage i have to finish top five on the stage or it's, it's a disaster no it's if you have one bad day this one bad day mm. we'll see we'll reassess it's only a bike race we'll reassess and then uh then cool. then, then can go forward from there yeah not counting down the thing going it's, it's it's six days to go it's five days to go four days to go no you think there's six opportunities left to gain more time there's five opportunities to gain more time 
or whatever. You know what I mean? It's you got to. It's a great way of looking at it. Got to be as positive as you can be. Yeah, and, and even when you lost a bit of time here and there, you know, some guys might freak out and oh no, I lost ten seconds. And it's like, well, you know, I lost ten seconds, but that's fine because I stayed safe. I could have broken my collarbone, exactly. and this is where I'm, I'm here in the race. Exactly. So, all right, now moving away a little bit from the race now. Do you guys both ride gravel and do you use it for training or leisure? Gravel, I, I, I'd say I, off-road for me because I, not exclusively gravel. But last year, no, but I have a cyclocross bike or a gravel. It's, it's a cyclocross bike. I have a, a really, a, it's a beautiful bike, Cannondale, carbon, the works. It's it's a dream bike. It's got SRM power meter. Well, it's got a power meter on it. It's got... Schmico. Durace, hydraulic, yeah. clutch mech. XTR clutch mech <laughs> righto righto uh, carbon wheels tubeless yeah, yeah. it's the I get the, I get it's the, the idea. dogs yeah. or the mutts and nuts to the polite version it's a beautiful bike um, and yeah I, when I lived in Pamplona I, I used to ride that there used to be a big path the way from Pamplona I don't know where where on earth it ended but it's this big what you class as a big gravel path it went up hill and down dale it was up and down steep little bits technical bits on it and the year that I got that bike in 2018 all winter I just rode on that it never got boring never got tiring mm. there was low it went through past through villages as well so you could pull in stop for a sandwich stop for a coffee fill your bottles up it was perfect it was perfect you could get all your training done with the power meter and all this shit all that stuff and uh, it was it was great I meant to say the last two questions were from CM and Jozu and uh, the next question here from Max and Michael and Catherine what do you guys think you'd be doing for a job if you weren't a pro cyclist? This is a common question, actually. What would you be doing? Um, I really don't know. It's a really difficult question that I'd rather not think about in a lot of ways. I would have liked to be in some kind of teaching job, I think. I think I'd be a good teacher. I think I'm, I wouldn't be sort of a usual sort of teacher. I think I'd be good, good relation with the kids and good uh, with the children. And, uh, on a good level with people, being able to speak to a lot of people and sort of bring a different energy. I think... Mm. What uh, subject? Any subject, I think. I don't know. I mean, mixed... Uh, sport, no. Definitely not sport, but... Uh, geography. I did quite like the teacher we had at high school, the geography teacher. He was he a was good good bloke I got on. He was one of the ones... He was, he was a teacher that I think I'd be quite like. You know what I mean? I'd get the best out of every student rather than just getting the best out of the conscientious ones. You know what I mean? Mm. But yeah, I think after my cycling career, I don't know what I'd do. It's, it's impossible to say now. Mm. To be in a job where you can sort of make a difference in people's lives I'm not talking about you know, like charity work things like that but like in like a more sort of mainstream way where you can like teach people or yeah n something that is totally nothing to do with me you know what I mean mm. I'm not gaining anything from it at the moment my job it's all about me you know what mm. I mean I, I sleep eat sleep and rest for me be nice to do the and opposite pe and people do stuff for me like my family and people like that it sounds terrible to say, but it's all about me. You know mm, what I mean? It's true, yeah. It's a uh, it's a selfish it's a selfish period of our lives, and I want it to be a period of my life. You see some riders and they they hang on to it. You know, they, they retire and they still can't let go of that 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 number one mentality. And for me, I look forward to letting go of that. I look forward to helping people. I enjoy helping people. I enjoy being considerate and mm. kind and things. And I think. That's something I look forward to. Whether I don't know, maybe I could apply that into the world of cycling. I don't know, maybe like a, a Swan Year or something. Maybe hmm. could that be? That could be sort of that similar sort of attitude where, so sort of like a selfless attitude. I don't know. I'd like to be more selfless in the future. Nice. Sort of kind of flip the flip the coin almost. I like it. I don't. I don't know. It'd be. I think the initial period of that might be tough, but once you eventually move into it, you'd be like, yeah, this is exactly what I want. Yeah. From Matt and Ben and Sean, favourite UK climb, favourite Preston climb? Oh. Favourite, and on the back of this, favourite ride around Lancashire and and coffee stop? Give us all your favourites. Okay, so favourite climb in the UK and favourite climb in my area, probably the same climb, probably a climb called Birdie Brow. It's, near, it's between Clitheroe and sort of in the middle between a town called Clitheroe and a town called Preston and it's it's, it's steep I mean it, it it was like the the length of the climb is like that easy section where I put it in the big ring gone 
yesterday on the angler you know what I mean? oh yeah that flat bit ten yeah. percent but in the, in the local areas it's quite it's a sort of a, a fear climb no one now you on the on the Strava things you go on other people all the climbs and stuff and the they'll have loads of people climbing them every day in day out but Burry Brow it's sort of people how long avoid is it? it there's a road you can there's a there's another climb called Chagley Brow that sort of you get to almost the same place but it's an easier sort of calmer climb oh the length it's like a six minute climb mm. it might be if I got full gas five or six minutes I think I can't remember the record but oh. yeah it, that, that that's my favourite climb because no one used to climb it so for me I think oh I'm getting an advantage by climbing it so if, it, if this is the, the climb that everyone fears and I do it regularly what's your favourite right around there um, probably up into the Trough of Bowl and up around that way similar similar sort of neck of the woods um, yeah Trough of Bowl and up around there it's, that's for me never get, you never get never get tired on a good day bad raining windy sunny it's the same for me good coffee out there uh, where do you stop for coffee the best place for me well pot of tea for me I'm not when I'm out oh. on the bike I would have pot of tea I think we discussed this before last year just for me it quenches the thirst better you know what I mean coffee on the in the UK no disrespect but a lot of places unless you go to a special sort of specific coffee shop the coffee can be a bit crap <laughs> so I think if you can't you can't f*** <laughs> a pot of tea so I always I always go for a a pot of tea in the UK but the, the place I go to is in Scorton a little village probably 10-15 miles from Preston about, I think about 12 miles from Preston um, Scorton and it's called the Apple Store Cafe and mm, it's, shout out it's a t- uh, shout out free pots of tea <laughs> if you're listening use the code Hugh Carthy <laughs> for your 10% <laughs> in the description below uh, hit the subscribe button uh, and the bell icon um, no it's called the Apple Store Cafe and it's like a it's set, it's set in this you have to climb up a little hill to get there and you go on this little dirt path to get there like the car park's a little dirt path it's not long about 50 metres long and you kind of wind into it and it's in the grounds of an old stately home and you sit in like the like the sort of oh, they're not conservatory what do you call them like the kind of plantation areas sort of mm. like the they've converted them into like they've got like roaring wood burning stoves in there and stuff and it's mm. really old school sounds good it's old school yeah it's uh, rustic sort of yeah rusty big pots of tea and fresh cakes scones cakes mm. uh, bacon sandwiches um, the works you know what I mean perfect alright we've got a couple last questions here do you enjoy some butter pies on your day off still uh, when I'm back in the UK and back in Preston always butter pies and look what is a butter pie it's a pie that full of butter no it, it's a it's a Preston it's a sort of Preston local to Preston I think Preston and surrounding areas I think um, basically it's a pota- like potato potato and onion pie it's the it's 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 that's the, it's the old school vegan vegetarian it's not vegan but vegetarian option you know what I mean but it's not it's it's a it's still up there ranks up there why is it there. called a butter pie I, f- I think because when you cut it open it's, I, I, I have no idea why it's called butter pie it's not because it's full of butter it's just I think maybe when you cut it open because it's quite pale inside or maybe people think oh it looks like I I don't know but it's got potato and onion and that's it inside sounds like a pasty no a pasty just different to a pie I'm not getting into an argument about pies and pasties <laughs> but it's just it is what it is it's local but if you speak to someone from from say Lancaster which is 20 miles up the motorway or 32k up the motorway whoever's listening you say can I butter pie they'll say what what are you on about you go 20 miles down down the motorway from Preston can I have butter pie though what, what are you on about but in Preston have butter pie everyone knows what a butter pie is but I go we always go to it's a place my mum used to my mum's been going there just around the corner from my mum used to live a pie shop well it's a bakery sell all sorts of confectionery and stuff uh, it's been going for donkey's years Gornal's Pies on New Old Lane if anyone's listening from Preston go in there you've got to get there early because a lot of the, the workmen and the tradesmen just shout out 10% another, another off shout, Hugh Carthy another, code another shout out yeah <laughs> uh, Gornal's Pies you won't miss it big green cool big green sign over the window and it's a great little great little shop meat and potato pies is a classic I think it's a, it'd be a tough call between the meat and potato and the well the steak ones the, the meat and potato which is like the classic then they have the steak pies which is slightly different they're normally the round the meat and potato and butter pies are round the steak ones are sort of like rectangular shape mm. like a, a rich dark gravy with steak bits of steak in it meat and potato obviously sort of uh, chunks of 
just potato, steak and onion, yeah, yeah. potato and whatever. The butter pie is the potato and the onion pie. Um, and then they have all the cakes, the cakes that go as well. And on, <laughs> they have a, they have, but they have a men they do like soup as well. They have a big like big urn for the soup. And on days of the week, so they have the Monday deal, Tuesday deal, Wednesday deal for or whatever the week the weekday deal. And that Monday will be like pie and peas, pie peas and gravy. So a pie in like a little polystyrene tub. Uh, the pie, a little few peas on the side and gravy. One day it'll be like uh, pie and beans or something. So <laughs> butter, butter pie and beans, I think is classic. So butter pie and then baked beans in the tray. The Wednesday will be like I don't know I'm, I can't remember. I've <laughs> it sounds like you've already known pretty well there. <laughs> I'll do like a pie. <laughs> uh, then yeah, Wednesday will be something else like pasty and pasty and chips or something. Thursday will be something else and Friday will be something else. And and you go there you go there lunchtime and or dinner and dinner time is what we call it in the north of England. Dinner is lunchtime and we call our dinner in the evening tea. So mm. it's breakfast, dinner, and tea. So if you go there at dinner time. It's full of workmen at yellow jackets, plastic hard hats on, all queuing up outside to get the not in COVID times, but in normal times they're all queuing up getting the getting the pie peas and gravy or the mm. they do sandwiches as well. They do like fresh sandwiches, tuna mayo and egg salad, ham and cheese, <laughs> BLT, all the rest. Oh, it's a great place. <laughs> oh, geez, we've got the whole menu there. Brilliant. Yeah. All right, last question. Well, the pain, me I say you got to. <laughs> nah, they're not. They're not. Well, I got two quick. There's two last quick questions. This is from Rob from Preston. Crumbly or cream Lancashire? Uh, what does that cream, mean? Cheese, cheese. Ah, right. So there's two Lan- Lancashire's Lan- UK in general. Um, I defend UK in a lot actually, but cheese is a, a big, big selling point of the UK. We do good cheese, um, and Lancashire especially. You obviously got you got your cheddar and your Stilton and your. Red Leicester, things like that, your, your famous ones, but Lancashire's pretty up there with the cheese in the cheese world, in well, the British cheese world. And there's two two kinds of cheese. There's uh, two types of main Lancashire cheese: Lancashire crumbly and Lancashire creamy. They're like a white a white cheese. They're quite mild cheese. They're not they're not a mature strong cheese. I can't remember the brand of them. There's a there's one brand that but I can't remember. But my nana, I won't say she she loves she loves buying cheese, the nice nice cheese. She'll, she'll push the boat out on cheese. She's not, <laughs> she won't, uh, she's not, I'm saying she's a wealthy woman, nothing like that, but. It comes to cheese. No, but she, she's from an age where things like butter, she lived through the war and stuff and things like butter and cheese, back in though they were like a, a, Delicacy. Lux, a real yeah. luxury item. You know, if you had butter on a once in a blue moon or some nice cheese, you had to really sort of savor it. So she goes to she goes to shop and she and you go around to a house and you sort of rummage through the fridge looking for something and there was a like huge block of Lancashire creamy cheese. So you like just you think oh, she's not watching. So you do like, open the open the plastic <laughs> Tupperware and cut a big slab. Of, <laughs> does scoff, she, does scoff she it knows? Down. Ah, she wants us to. Oh, she okay. she loves it. Uh, but yeah, she. So for us, it's it's always creamy. Creamy. But that said, cream. If you're just eating it like a pig, just chopping slabs off and eating it creamy it's sort of difficult because it goes both ways on a sandwich crumbly is good even despite it makes a it makes a real mess when you're eating it yeah my parents at, when we went to school my parents used to buy us we used to make sandwiches with like this warburton seeded batch or something and it was like a whole the bread a whole yeah. grain bread with these seeds and stuff and the bread itself was crumbly then they used to put crumbly cheese crumbly cheese and then have you heard of branston pickle no it's like a look it up it's like a a, a dark a dark pickle with like chunks of carrot and onion and stuff in it a real dark pickle uh, with that thrown in as well to kind of, kind of slop it up a bit so you open your sandwich you open your cling film and like you you're sort of sort of bra- bracing for the <laughs> bracing for it crumbling before you even started eating it but but that said the crumbly cheese on a sandwich I think is better you're not selling it yeah right okay. it's, 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 but it's good but it's great cheese it's great cheese the next time I come back I'll try and if Bring you're in Girona in the winter I'll try and uh, I'll try and get you some vac packed and uh, sent over to you because it's it's great cheese it's fantastic cheese last question from Tom when will you take the KOM back on the birdie brow I, well I had it on a secret account I did it. I, I I don't I don't even have the login details for that account, so I'd probably have to make a new account to set up. I've been logged out, and I don't know how to. I don't know the passwords. I can't remember the password stuff. So that's gone now. But I can't remember. I think Ian Bibby's got it. He's a local. You heard that name, Ian Bibby? He used to be a 
a decent rider. I haven't heard of him, no. Sorry. <laughs> I think you might have heard of him. He, I think he's got the record now. But he broke it by quite a way, but there's a bit of controversy because I got the record on the Strava under my secret account. Then a few people flagged it. But so then, are you going to go back and take it this winter? I don't know because when they do it, they'll do it on race set. When I do it, I go back with a training bike. Yeah. You could still do it though. In angry loo form. In ang- angry loo form. Uh, yeah, I can't be bothered. <laughs> Oh God, I, I, when I go, whenever I go back to the UK now, I'm usually in a sort of holiday mode. Yeah. It's either mid-season break or end-of-season break or Christmas, and I, I can't be going six minutes long bird. And you know what I mean? I, I, who can be with that in December? <laughs> well, there we go, guys. It's time for us to actually do some training. It's on our rest day. Hugh's been kind enough to sit with me for an hour or more, mate. Thanks a lot, and I'm looking forward to the last week. Thank you. Thanks for everyone. Cheers. Well, Mitch, over the first couple of weeks of this Vuelta, we've seen Hugh Carthy become a team leader for your team, EF Pro Cycling. And I'm wondering what he's like to work with or work for. I don't really know how um, that dynamic works when, you know, I mean, he's obviously a gifted climber. We already knew that, but here he is in contention at the right at the top end of GC. And I guess that you know, can change the way that, uh, that that riders are around one another. I, well, I don't know. You tell me. It's a very individual thing and different guys take it on different ways, as you can imagine in all types of jobs as well. You know, some guys lead by they're very loud and you know about it, and other guys lead by example. And I, th- I get the feeling in this race, Hugh's really finding his feet. Um, he's very much so leading by example. When he says something, he's showing it. He's backing it up with his legs. And off the bike, he's finding his feet there too. And he's actually been, I really respect it. He's just been a real leader and he said what he wanted. He's, I want to ride up the front. I want to ride in, you know, fourth in GC or second in GC, where we were. Let's fight for that position and very vocal about it. And I love that. I love that he's grabbed it with both hands. And then secondly, he's been able to back it up with his legs. So and me as a teammate and even the young guys in our team, when they hear this coming from his mouth, but then they see him do it with his legs, that is the best way you can be as a leader. So I think it's just been a beautiful progression over the last few years. I've seen right been riding with him when I first rode with him at the Giro. He was that guy trying to get him breaks. You know, last year he won that amazing stage in the Tour of Swiss, and this year he's sort of blossomed into this rider that we see, I think, for the future. And with this leadership, understanding that, understanding being in a GC role for three weeks, that's what this. This Vuelta is really all about, um, aside from the results, what comes out of this, I think, is this this new position as a leader. And I see him taking on really, really well, you know, 12 days in, and it's been a great experience for him, for me, watching it from the outside. So um, I think it's been a great experience. Do you think it helps, uh, you know, when a rider has kind of done his time as a a helper as well. I mean, Hugh Carthy must have, over the years he's been racing in Grand Tours, he, he will have done his share of pacing people back or, um, you know, uh, getting bottles and, and doing the, the, the teamwork. So he he kind of knows what it is that he's asking others to do for him now. I think that is a big element of it. And I also think a big element of it is his time he spent in a Spanish team in Caja Rural before he came to this team. He learnt the ropes there, the European way. He speaks the language, speaks Spanish. He's got friends outside of his normal friendship group in terms of English speakers and our team. So he's immersed in the cycling culture. He understands the old times. He understands the the elements of cycling respect, you know, the, the different pedigrees of the riders. And I think that is a massive part of cycling, you know, the tradition that is very much getting lost in the more recent years. And... I think to become a true leader in the teams, you need to understand all elements of everyone's position in the team, doing the roles yourself, but also the history of the sport. And that's something that he loves. And I I really do see that in him. And in just the conversations we have at the dinner table, you can can relate to him in all types of levels, modern day cycling and old, old cycling. So that's another great element of him as well. And just lastly, I'm thinking back to last year's Vuelta where you know the team had quite a lot of 
of bad luck in the first two thirds of the race and then you really had to kind of reset and uh, it all came good with the stage that Sergio Iguita won didn't it and, and I just wonder how what's the contrast you know this year does it does it feel different do you, do you all have more of a spring in your step because you know you're getting up for the last week of the race and you're, you're right there banging contention definitely yeah I think it was that that first win of Mike's really just sort of broke that bubble you know we we came in with Danny Martinez was going to be our GC hope Hugh was his first chance at GC but we weren't too sure and then Mike got that stage win and then suddenly the pressure was off and as we saw Hugh just kept going forward and the rest of us were happy to support him um you know and yesterday was a massive thing too uh, the angry Lou Hugh being on GC, being able to ride away from the best riders. And now it's just like, let's just see what happens this last week. It's not like, you know, last year where we're just holding things together and hoping for some kind of result. That was a completely different scenario. Now we're just sort of happy to see what happens and really got a big fight there as well. And sort of a happy fight, if you know what I mean. Like, let's push for it. Let's see what we can get out of this because we've achieved so much already. And let's just see what we can do from here. So... I think that's an amazing way to approach the last week and I'm trying to stay on that side of things and not get too worried about the mountains coming ahead. And just lastly, I mean, obviously he won on the Angleroo yesterday. I mean, that is a a, a really, really tough climb. I can't think of any tougher. And maybe Zazonkalan in the Giro is, uh, you know, in the same bracket. Um, But I'm always fascinated by this and I'm sure I've asked you this before uh, in different races, but at what point did you know that, Hugh Carthy had won the stage did you get a message over the radio or were you out of range or were you sort of climbing up wondering what was going on up front it was very similar to a couple of years ago when Mike Woods won a stage in the Basque country it was a steep climb and I was dropped and I listened to the whole commentary on the radio it was in English then obviously because Mike speaks English this time it was in Spanish because Hugh speaks Spanish and our director Juama is, is Spanish but I could just tell by the enthusiasm and I, I picked up a few words here and there that he'd won. Sure enough, the team car that was following me decided to come up next to me on a, let's say, 20, 25% grade and wanted to have a whole conversation about the victory. And I, I was able to give him a thumbs up and a little smile and I said, let's just, let's just chat about that in a 20 or 30 minutes when I get over this thing. <laughs> Yeah, not really in the mood to chat at the moment. No, it's exactly. It was here. it was great, and and I'm really looking forward to um to finishing this for Welter. It is an element of the end of the year. I am feeling that, but I really want to get to the end of this race with a big success we've had so far, and also on a personal level that it's been a long year, and I really want to finish it on my own terms. But um, I do want to say to everyone out there, hang in for the next podcast. It's going to be the last podcast for us from Life in the Peloton. I've got a very special podcast, so I'm not going to reveal what that is. It's coming up in two weeks. The end of the season's here. So until then, guys, thanks a lot. You have been listening to Life in the Peloton. The producer of this episode was Will Jones. The music in this episode was composed by Pete Shelley. Thanks, mate.